We are all currently under attack, and I believe that we should all be a lot more aware of the relationship between truth and technology. The post-truth theory that you've heard about, our post-truth era, it's not the first post-truth era. In fact, it's just one in a long line of post-truth theories, and it certainly won't be the last. And today, I'd like to talk about two post-truth theories, the one that we're currently in, and one that arose in Nazi Germany in their 20s and 30s and 40s. In 2014, our company in York was appointed by the National Holocaust Center to work on a project called the Forever Project. That project involved working with survivors of the Holocaust, recording their testimony, which is usually an hour long, using advanced digital techniques. They also then answered a thousand questions each um, which were posed to them by our team. To make that happen, each of the survivors had to be in the studio with us for a whole week. In fact, we filmed 10 of them in total. Here are the other nine. And each one of them had their own completely mind-blowing personal life story. And since then, we've been processing the answers and creating an interactive installation uh, at the National Holocaust Center, which means that the center can continue to offer its audience the ability to hear survivors speak, ask questions, and get answers beyond the life of the survivors. In fact, forever. And in 2016, that project was awarded a place on the Nominet Trust 100, which is an initiative by the, one of the founding companies of the internet, which recognized recognizes te technology used for good causes. Now, as part of that project, our team witnessed 200 hours firsthand of survivor testimony and answers to questions. All of the survivors were very, very happy to get their story down in this way, in, in, a, in breadth and in depth. And a lot has been spoken about the project in academic circles. It was an honor to meet and get to know the survivors through the process. Overall, it was a very uplifting experience. And it's changed the way that I think about how people speak. I'm much more attuned to the way that people speak, what they choose to say, and who they choose to say it to in society. And their message of tolerance, their message of respect, and their message of healthy, positive discourse has stayed with me and always will do. But after the last survivor had gone and the door closed, the production team sat there and we thought, wow, what are we going to do? That was a really unusual life experience that not many people are ever going to have the opportunity to go through. So what happened to us, the production team? Well. A lot has happened since then. Those recordings took place in 2015 and early 2016. And since then, we've had uh, a major escalation in Syria. We've had Brexit, uh, Trump, and then more recently, uh, events in Brazil and Myanmar. And I was very concerned when I saw some of the messaging around those political campaigns. And I was also very concerned when I saw the technological means by which those messages were being sent and targeted um, through social media. And I felt a strong drive to become a data privacy campaigner because of that, my experience with that. And you might think, well, how does that follow? Well, the data that we create about ourselves online every day is being used against us to target us with messaging. And it works like this. A political campaign creates sometimes hundreds of messages. I've seen campaigns create 200 different messages across dozens of topics. But if you were to look at any one of those adverts, those messages in isolation, you'll see it's a single graphic with a single very clear message designed to elicit a reaction in a certain type of person. And then we've got a voting population in this country, something like 40 or 50 million people. And the campaign know if they get the right message or combination of messages to the right personalities, then they will, they're likely to elicit the response that they need. Now, how do they get those messages to the right people? How do they know who to target? 
Well, it's because of the data that we all create about ourselves daily through likes and comments on social media, our purchases, a whole world of different bits of data which are connected together becomes the targeting system for these technologies. <coughs> and the, that ability to target us has taken lawmakers and regulators almost completely by surprise. And we're having to catch up. Uh, they've started, but there's a long way to go before we can say that regulation and law is going to protect us from this. Now, when I'm talking to people about data privacy, a very common comment is, well, OK, I can kind of accept that that might happen, but it doesn't affect me. I can see through it. And the words of one survivor that we worked with in particular echo through my head when I hear that comment. Martin Stern was born in the Netherlands just before the outbreak of World War II. His father was forced into hiding. His mother died in childbirth, giving birth to his younger sister, Erica. Aged five at school, Martin was arrested and handed over to the Nazis. He was bundled into Vesterbork transit camp and ultimately Theresienstadt ghetto in what is now the Czech Republic. And eventually he was liberated in 1945. And I'm very happy to say that he's here today to help us with this. So please welcome <laughs> Dr. Martin. <laughs> Dr. Martin Stern, thank you very much for being here. Now, one of the things that you said when we were going through the recordings of the Forever Project that really stuck with me was the fact that the Nazi perpetrators, they weren't mad people, they weren't clinically insane, they weren't psychopaths, they were perfectly normal people who were radicalized through a process. Yes, Chris, uh, folk psychology is uh, the problem, not the solution. Uh, the leaders uh, definitely had abnormal personalities, as many leaders do, uh, but the millions of followers who, uh, without, them, without whom they would have been nothing, were a perfectly normal population. Mm -hmm. uh, psychology experiments have repeatedly shown that perfectly normal people will do quite horrific things if you just put them in the wrong circumstances. The historian Christopher Browning showed that a group of mass murderers in Poland were perfectly normal people before and indeed perfectly normal people afterwards. In every genocide you get the same kind of story. We were neighbours. We exchanged congratulations on each other's religious festivals. He and I shared a desk together. Uh, he and I played on the same football team, and that guy came with a Gestapo. That guy came with a machete. That guy became my interrogator and my torturer. So, the, bond, the, the uh, conventional popular idea of genocides and mass horrors is it's due to a few monsters. Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, and so on. The reality is worse. It's people like us. And the bit of that, the, uh, part, the part of that that really, really chimes with me is the idea that n nobody thinks that they're susceptible to this message. In, in other words, everybody thinks that they're n not susceptible to the message. Yes, uh, psychology has uh, moved on a lot in the last 50 years, and um, the things that proper uh, behavioral scientists have discovered are surprising and often counterintuitive. We, it's now well known uh, that we are built with a self-bias. We think we're better than other people in all sorts of ways. And there's a reason for that. There are people who don't. They are the people who are depressed. Being depressed makes you more realistic, as it turns out, but it has bad consequences. So we, there are good reasons why we have an element of self-bias. But it can get out of kilter, and particularly when we're functioning as a tribe. We idealize 
ourselves and our own tribe, we demonize the other, and the result can be quite explosive. And of course, we've got the electronic media, which act as a megaphone and as a positive feedback loop. Mm. This is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And of course, this isn't the first time that these uh, mass media uh, opportunities have, have arisen. I mean, going back as far as the 15th and 16th century with the Gutenberg Press, um, then in the 1920s, the explosion of domestic ownership of radio sets um, used uh, to effect by the Nazis and by the Italian uh, powers. Then uh, late 20s with the invention of talkies, the motion pictures with sound, again used by those two uh, parties. Uh, again, forward to the explosion of domestic ownership of television sets in the 1950s and 60s and that heyday. Fast forward a bit more to 1990s and the invention of internet advertising and banners and use in political campaigns and of course to our present day now with social media and social media targeted messaging. This isn't the first time that we've seen this, is it? Well, I had to learn from a school teacher in uh, Loughborough College that uh, in the early days of printing, it was used to a large extent and prolifically for scurrilous political leaflets, which were all over the place. We learned how to cope with that technology. Uh, radio, uh, public service radio broadcasting started at the beginning of the 1920s at about the same time as the Nazi party. And the Nazi party, when it came to power, made vicious use of it. Mm -hmm. um, the cinema, in the sense of talkies and cinema chains, uh, again, uh, was developing just as the Nazi party was growing and uh, coming into power. And uh, again, they used it uh, with devilish cunning. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, we've got uh, new methods of uh, communication now, and which we have not yet learned how to deal with. Uh, the, the problem is uh, not so much technology. The problem is us. The problem is uh, our human failings. Mm -hmm. And it's time that, you know, we, the three R's, are already not all we're teaching kids in school. Mm -hmm. But we need to add something else, and it's of vital, literally vital importance. We need to uh, uh, tr uh, teach young people to understand the roots of our own thoughts and our own behavior. Um, so, because the technology is now so clever that it will find our flaws, even if we are unaware of them even if no one is aware of them. Mm -hmm. So this is a project of major importance. Agreed. And turning to what history can tell us of how to deal with that um, uh, and, and how we might be able to apply it to our lives today, um, in terms of data privacy, there are many things that we need to be doing, but if I was forced to reduce it to just three things that we can all do, firstly, has to be about cognition. We have to come to terms with the fact that this is happening. Being aware of it happening is the first line of defense within that. Secondly, it's about propagation. It's okay any individual knowing and accepting that, but we need to talk to each other, we need to spread the news. Not everybody has the opportunity to come to a TEDx event. Um, and thirdly, about self-editing and control of, of our behavior online because of this exhaust of data that we create every day. There are, met, there are uh, fairly straightforward measures that you can take with your, uh, with your phones, your apps, and your computers, and your behavior online to minimize that exhaust and not make it too easy for those people. Just a, a point to underline this. This month, the Information Commissioner, Elizabeth Denham, said this. We are at a crossroads. Trust and confidence in the integrity of our democratic processes risks being disrupted because the average person has little idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Strong words. So Martin, how did we deal with those historical cases of manipulation through mass media? Well, in the case of Nazis, only uh, their crushing defeat uh, would suffice. Mm -hmm. uh, a terrible price was paid even by the victors. Uh, in the case of the uh, problem we're dealing with now, there are large numbers of perfectly ordinary people who can see that there is something wrong. The problem is 
that they are susceptible to being persuaded by a simple answer, mm -hmm. a simple answer which happens to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, wisdom to choose between answers that lead to violence and answers that avoid violence and allow evolution. Um, so it's a challenging, it's, it's, it's perhaps a mentally more challenging task than the human race has ever faced. But we can't avoid it. It's our job to deal with it. And briefly, um, the front line. Uh, where we, let's, let's assume for a minute that we're starting to get a grip on social media and the interaction with targeting. But Martin, have you come across anything coming up on the horizon that gives you cause for concern? Well, uh, I'll give you, uh, I think, a very sharp example. Uh, I'm a patient and a an, uh, great uh, and a supporter of Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, which works together with Google to uh, handle big data on eye examinations. And uh, indeed, they can take uh, uh, pictures of the retina and uh, make diagnoses that will enable blindness to be avoided in vast numbers of people in our aging population. This, there's no question. This is absolutely wonderful. I support it totally. But it turns out that the Google artificial intelligence can work out from your retinal picture pretty, with a pretty high degree of accuracy, whether you're male or female. Now, it could be that somebody, for reasons which are perfectly valid, gets hold of a picture of your retina. There are various ways it might happen. And they might be able to work out pretty accurately whether you're male or female. It might be you don't want people, those, that person to know that. So here you've got an example of something which is undoubtedly extremely good, but it has another effect which you wouldn't want. And I think this brings it into high relief. Thank you, Martin. Now, I'd just like to finish very briefly by saying that um, all too soon, those with a first-hand knowledge of the 30s won't be around to offer us their advice anymore, and we need to listen before it's too late. Thank you very much. Thank you.